All right. Next up, presenting Why You Shouldn't Write an SPA, Sam Schoensberg. Give it up. Give it up. OK, all dialed in. Hi, everybody. My name is Sam Schoensberg, and the title of my talk is Don't Build an SPA. So first, a few introductions. I work at the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence Research. Uh, we are a nonprofit here, in, uh, just located down the street in Fremont. And we were founded by Paul Allen to pursue AI research for the common good. So you're probably asking yourself, wait, this is a conference about JavaScript. Why am I here listening to a guy talk about how a bunch of rogue scientists are building Skynet in Fremont? Rest assured, we're not building Skynet. And uh, this is, in fact, a talk about JavaScript. And today, I'm here to talk about uh, some of the lessons we learned in building an application called Semantic Scholar. Semantic Scholar is an application that um, provides academic search and cutting edge, uh, or a cutting edge academic search engine. So think of it like Google Scholar, but with a lot more under the hood. And the idea is that we want to power something that allows researchers to do their job uh, better by focusing less on trying to find research and uh, uh, focus more on the research they're doing. So first, let's talk about what we built. Spoiler alert, it's an SPA. You can see a quick diagram of the architecture here. I'm not very good at adding color to my, uh, uh, the diagrams I, I create, so bear with me. Uh, but you can see when a user comes to uh, or makes a request to our website, they're first directed to a Node.js based application server. We're running a full React application inside of it. It interacts with the Scala based API to get the data it needs, which interacts with various stores. Uh, it renders the complete experience, delivers it to the end user. Uh, and then from that point forward, once the user's uh, browser it, uh, has uh, rendered the document, it's going to take over and all additional tra page transitions are going to occur in the browser. Um, you might be making a face like this, some of our engineers do. So let's talk about what went well. Like, what did we get from using an SPA? Um, first off, our site feels fast. Now, notice it's air quoted. It feels fast. Uh, it's not actually that fast. Our metrics show that you know our page load times are, are mediocre at best. Uh, but when we interview users, they time and time again say, "Man, your site is so fast. Like, how'd you do that? You probably put a lot of effort into making this thing uh, go quickly." Uh, the answer is we didn't. We chose an SBA, and it gave us that. So this really spoke to the message of perceived latency and how important it is for a user's perception of speed in your application. We also uh, have great test coverage. Uh, and this isn't necessarily something you get from an SPA. I'd credit it more toward, to React. But um, you know, it's, it's something that the engineering team really enjoys. I know a few of the PMs in the crowd probably just cringed and went, no, don't write tests. Just get, get the feature done. Uh, but this really is something that actually, in the end, helped us um, make changes quickly, and as the code base grew, it allowed us to change things with confidence. So uh, that was a benefit. Uh, code reuse. Uh, I remember about eight or nine years ago thinking to myself, man, I really like dislike having to write this like server template and then replicate a lot of the same behavior and uh, structure in uh, JavaScript code as well. That was a pain to maintain. And I remember when Node came out, I thought, okay, we're getting closer to being able to write once and run it anywhere. Um, it's pretty refreshing to have now implemented something where we can write these rich components and use them all over the place. So that's pretty exciting. Our site also indexes very well, but it didn't always. And this is a little lesson we learned. Uh, we first went out and we said, let's build this client-side SPA-based application. We built it. We figured we don't need to render on the server at all. We'll be fine. Uh, Google indexes JavaScript, right? That's kind of, there's vague documentation indicating this. So we did a little test. We launched the site with that. We put up a sitemap with 100 um, top papers there. And this is what we got. So you can see the title tag is the same for each result. There's no content. Uh, there's no meta description. Like, nothing's really being parsed. We pop it into Google Webmaster Tools. And in fact, yep, we're rendering nothing. So Google thinks we have a bunch of empty pages. Uh, I don't know about you, but that's not so great for relevance. And furthermore, I don't exactly like to live dangerously on the web. So I'm not going to click one of these links. So, we ended up making it isomorphic and added the capability to render on the server. That fixed our problems, and now we get a lot of organic search traffic. But it was additional complexity we had to take on. Another bonus is that our developers love working on the application. We might not be quite as happy as this guy, like coding in the woods, like breath of fresh air, like yes. Um, but we enjoy the stack, and we've actually had a few engineers join who said, I was really excited to work on a modern kind of uh, a web stack, and it was an exciting opportunity. Uh, so that's a benefit. Let's talk about what didn't go so well. So these are a few uh, screenshots of what it takes uh, to load our JavaScript bundle and our HTML payload on a 2G connection. Now, granted, a 2G connection is a pretty bad connection, but as our site expanded, we saw more mobile users, we saw international traffic, we saw people on slower connections. This is 20 seconds, 18 seconds to download our JavaScript bundle and two seconds to download our HTML payload. 
don't know about you guys, but if I'm on a website and it takes 20 seconds, like, well, at 10 seconds or maybe even two seconds, I've, like, stopped, right? I'm just done. At 20 seconds, I've, like, thrown my phone in the ocean or something. I'm like, I'm, I'm out of here. Uh, but the other kind of story here is that this really crept up on us. Um, we started with a really simple application, right? You bundle everything into one bundle. It's fine. It's not too big. It's going to load quickly. Um, as any product does, you iterate quickly, right? Your site just expands. You add all this additional content and accordingly a lot of extra uh, JavaScript. As it does, that bundle gets bigger and bigger and, you know, we were iterating quickly and moving fast so we didn't necessarily have metrics in place to record, uh, say, the bundle size or have great metrics around user uh, uh, download times. We set those up later, and that's when we caught this problem. So this really crept up. At that point, we knew we needed to invest in things like um, dynamic bundle loading and uh, uh, hot loading resources, things like that. But it came late, and we had a lot of users who probably had a really bad experience as a result. Uh, and on the HTML side, it turns out, surprise, surprise, that if you take all of the data required for your uh, view and serialize it, and stick it in a, uh, 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 into a JavaScript file so that the store can rehydrate, uh, that's gonna blow out the payload size pretty big. Now granted, um, you know, this is a lot of data and we aren't being super smart about what pieces of data we need for the initial render, so there's techniques to, uh, which can help you work around this. Another thing that was tricky is that isomorphism is hard. Um, and I know we're all engineers, we like tough problems. And this is a bit of a contrived example, but you can see we're just trying to set a cookie and we have to first see, like, are we in the, you know, in the browser? If so, let's manipulate this document.cookie string. Otherwise, like, magically get some current request handle and set the appropriate HTTP header or throw some cryptic but fun exception. But the point is, is, like, while this may look somewhat simple, you're going to build on this, you're going to build a lot of this type of complexity, right? You're going to build, um, you know, this abstraction and an abstract, similar abstractions, and your code base is the complexity is going to grow. That complexity makes hard to debug problems, additional test coverage you need, and it's going to make it um, difficult for you to focus on building new features. There's also the fact that just stateful applications are complex, and what I've done to kind of help illustrate this is this is a sample, uh, an example of how a, a traditional server rendered application might work. It's about Yetis, because Yetis are cool, and it uses the name of my dog, Odie, which is an eight pound uh, Yorkshire Terrier. So, <laughs> but, so first off, we get a request for that URL, we find a handler for that request, we try to handle that route. We query some data. Once the data comes back, we load up our HTML template, replace some inline variables, and shoot it back to the user. Simple, straightforward, a nice isolated transaction. Let's think about it with like an isomorphic React application that's running on the server. Here, we you know, similarly find a handler for the request, handle the route, but now we've got to render that component, right? We want to be immediately responsive to the user and render something, show them something. So we render our Yeti cave with a loading state. We then query the data. When that data is done querying, we dispatch an action. We emit a change from that store that handles that dispatched action. We handle that change and then render. And granted, this is using a flux pattern, uh, but you can see that's, a, that's additional complexity, right? This is a lot simpler. And so, again, with a contrived example, you can see that there's kind of a complexity change. And as your app gets more complicated, you add more and more stores, you've got a lot more to reason about. So remember that when you're building an SBA, because this, this trade-off um, will mean that you're spending time debugging and building these kind of structures. Another big thing we learned is that it turns out analytics aren't free anymore. Uh, I imagine a lot of you have built a website, and your product team has said, hold on, hold on, we need user analytics. How are we going to do this? And you say, don't worry, I've got you covered. You go to Google Analytics, you get that little snippet, you paste it in, deploy the site, and boom, you're done, you get a gold star, a promotion, you retire to the Bahamas, like everything's good. Um, with an SPA, that's just not the case. We did this, we dropped it in. Turns out you get the first page load. Um, you get some information about where the user's from and the initial like download time. You get a lot of the goodness, but as the user drives deeper into your site, Google doesn't pick up that additional, those additional transactions. So you need to use something like New Relic, uh, they have an uh, SPA browser plugin, or um, uh, there's a plugin or a tool called Heap that are pretty useful. But even those in our case were not sufficient, so we actually had to write a custom instrumentation mechanism and instrument it throughout the app. Turns out you also need to test that. So we had this great custom instrumentation. It was up and to the right, up and to the right, and then one day miraculously just explodes and goes down. When it does, uh, your product team's gonna run and say, oh my gosh, the site is broken, what's going on? And you say, no, 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 don't worry. It's just a bug in our code. But, so we ended up having to spend a lot of time writing uh, a lot of test coverage for this uh, as well. So in conclusion, am I saying like you shouldn't build an SBA like ever, like this is just a wash, it's just, this is a bad trend, it's a total anti-pattern, no. That's not what I'm saying at all actually. I'm just saying that, um, you know, 
I'm, all of us get really excited about new technologies, myself included. We are so excited about React. We are so excited about you know, client-side uh, uh, or SPA, the SPA architecture that we wanted to build it. And I don't think we spent a lot of time thinking about the trade-offs before we decided to use it. Granted, I think we got a lot of good things out of it, but I just want to encourage all of us to think really hard when we're building something, like is this an application or is this a website? If it's a website, if it's my blog or something, let's just use standard HTML and server, red te server render templates and those old tried and true uh, tools because they're going to allow us to focus on tougher problems elsewhere in the stack. That's all I've got today. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. You can find me on Twitter as at CodeViking or email me at sam at codeviking.net. Thanks, everybody. Thank